Welcome on behalf of the Center for Public Interest Advocacy and Collaboration, CPAC. Welcome to the Daynard Roundtable Abolition and Building uh, the Future We Build Together. We are so fortunate to have our panel line up today. Really a brilliant crew that you're going to hear from. Um, you don't need to hear more of me. I'm just going to introduce our facilitator, our very own professor of law and criminal justice, Daniel Medwed. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, welcome to the tax policy seminar. <laughs> Oh, not fun. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. This is such a distinguished panel. I'm going to start with the introductions and then we'll kick things off. First of all, uh, our distinguished Daynard lecturer, this book, Becoming Abolitionists, I'm not a religious man, as many of you know, but this is the Bible. For those of you who are interested in abolition, this is not only a high level work of scholarship, it's a how to book, it's accessible. This is what lawyers and scholars should be writing. Thank you for this book, and thank you for being our Dana speaker. <laughs> On my immediate right, we have uh, Mallory Honora, who's the Director of Families for Justice as Healing, a wonderful organization. Mallory will tell us about uh, that in a moment. Uh, to Mallory's right, we have uh, Sachi James, uh, who is the Director of Reimagining Communities at that organization. Uh, the Families for Justice is Healing, as well as the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. Thank you, Sashi, for being here. Um, of course, but I think Derek Parnell gets an extra, uh, you know, double, double dose is our gainer. Uh, this is our gainer. So. Um, on Derek's right is our very own, we're claiming Carlton Williams, Carl Williams, for many reasons. He has been a Daynard before. Right? No. Govelber, I'm sorry. Sorry, Dick, wherever Dick is. Um, and we do a lot of work with him on various causes. He uh, is an activist here in Boston, a lawyer, a true mo movement lawyer, and a professor at <coughs> Cornell, uh, but ideally at Northeastern one day. Uh, and on Carl's right is uh, Professor Walter Johnson, who is the Winthrop Professor of History and Professor of African and African American Studies at Harvard University, and has made the long trek across the river to join us. <laughs> Thank you, Walter. Um, so to begin, we'll just, I'll kick things off with a question. Panelists will then uh, offer their views on this question. And the question, sort of the opener is, why revolution and not evolution? There's a big debate in criminal justice reform circles, right? Do you embrace incremental or gradual changes to get to the finish line? to have a more equitable criminal justice system? Or do you try to promote dramatic change, revolutionary change? What is the nexus or interaction between evolution and revolution in mass incarceration and potentially eradicating mass incarceration? So without further ado, just a small question to start things off. Mallory, any thoughts? <laughs> you don't have to. We could have volunteers. Um. I, I mean, I think for me, it's it, the the, um, the how is certainly important, and so is the why. Um, so uh, we're from our perspective um, at Families for Justice and Healing, and I'd just like to take a moment to just introduce that work for a second. Is um, we were founded by Andrea James um, in Danbury Federal Correctional Institute with women that she was incarcerated with. Um, at the picnic table in the yard, um, and those sisters continue to be the leadership circle of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. And from the prison yard to now, in the organizing that we do, and we continue to be guided by our leadership of formerly incarcerated women, the mission has always been to end the incarceration of women and girls, period. And now that there is, because of organizers um, and leaders and directly affected people raising this relentlessly for generations, there is more talk about abolition that's more accessible to more people in a long legacy, a centuries long legacy of organizing. Um, but that audacious goal like happened from the prison yard because women that were living through it themselves knew that that was what the call was. And so um, 12 years later, we're still doing everything that we possibly can towards that mission while not leaving the people who are incarcerated behind and their well-being and their dignity as we fight for their freedom every single day. And so, I mean, Absolutely, the something that we encounter in our work all the time is is reformist reforms that I think 
critical resistance and other, other leaders in the abolitionist movement have given us this lens about how do we spend our time and how do we also not continue to empower or equip or finance a system that is creating death and destruction um, in our communities. And so that line is really important. I, and I, I'm sure more people will speak to us. But for us, it's really clear from, from, from the perspective of directly affected women that the courts will absolutely not save us. The function of policing is continuing to uh, enact oppression and the system of white supremacy and jail and prisons do nothing but cause further harm, period. And we're like very clear about that. So in the moment, like what we're doing might include a large range of tactics, but we're very clear like about what the vision is. Um, and I like to think that we embrace the diversity of tactics because we're trying to move things like all at once. And we recognize the limitations of those tactics at the, at the same time, but what, we, what we're very clear about is not selling our people out or throwing our people under the bus to make it criminalization or demonization or dehumanization of people any more normal or possible because of the organizing that we're doing. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question well, but. I think that she did a great job explaining what we do, um, especially because we're a duo. Um, so great job, Mallory. <laughs> um, but also, I think to just highlight accountability, because I think that a lot of people connect uh, abolition with not holding people accountable. And so what Mallory was saying as far as like crossing the spectrum of like really pinpointing every harm that is done in the community, every poverty line, substance use, mental health, whether it's new prisons, whether it's police, whether it's the gang unit, we understand that there's a lot of transgressions that happen and we know that there is a, a space that we need to get to to address the healing that people need to get and also stop the cycle of our people going into incarceration. So when we say that we're creating a world for our people to come home, we're also creating a world for our people that to not even enter prisons and jails or have any interactions with police in general. And so we are creating, that's the infrastructure that we call reimagining communities. And so I just wanted to also uplift what you said and then also um, extend that as well because we do believe in accountability and we know that only we can heal each other, only we can save each other and that means dismantling the current system that we have and creating something that works for everybody. Um, so I just um, wanted to tell a little bit of a story in the theory, spirit of uh, revolution and evolution because I think they're, they're much more merged than we think. And, and a lot of what, what Mallory and Sashi were saying. So people might know, have people been to the SJC, the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, been to the building downtown? You should go visit, see things happen, watch an argument. Um, but in that building um, in downtown Boston, something revolutionary happened, right? Um, someone was on, there was a hearing uh, for a black man and a bunch of community members went, right? And they were there, a lot of black women. And during the hearing, uh, a disturbance was created, um, and a bunch of the black, mostly black women, ran up, got the black man who was the subject of the hearing, grabbed him, forced many of the court officers down to the ground, um, rushed him out a back door. It was believed that they had uh, allies that worked in the court, and and rushed him to freedom. And that person uh, fled to Canada and was never uh, recaptured. That was about math, about 200 years ago, and that, per <laughs> that person was an enslaved person. Huh. That, to be frank, that is some revolutionary shit, right? <laughs> and, but, but that is the thing that we think, like, my God, like, that is that. But every day, right, right now, um, some, some colleagues of, of, of ours, some friends of ours are, are on trial for, you know, uh, someone charged with a drug offense right now that's looking at a mandatory minimum just in Roxbury Court. That work is not different than that other work, right? But it's the everyday grind. And anyone who does abolition, I think anyone who does abolition work will tell you, like, there's a whole bunch of slow ass, every single day, grind, 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 right? Like trying to stop the building of a women's prison and objecting to it. Um, some, some comrades of ours are trying to stop the building of a federal prison in Pennsylvania, a giant federal prison, right? And one of the, the arguments that they're making is, that it is an environment, it's, an envir it's environmentally destructive to a habitat of bats, right? That slow grind, it does not seem like revolutionary, like running up in the court, grabbing someone and running out. But if they don't build that federal prison, everybody will tell you there's a whole bunch of people who are not going to be in federal prison, right? Because they're going to have an extra 1,000 beds, and you know if they have 1,000 beds, it's going to be 2,000 people in there, right, coming in and out. So I think the revolutionary work or radical work or abolitionist work 
most of it is slow grind little stuff. But one of the things I'll say to, to you all, um, and I'm also going to just say it because looking from here, we can see it. I'm going to mention the gender dynamic or my perceived gender dynamic of this room. Um, it's a lot. It seems a lot to, to so one side of the spectrum of gender. And I think that actually is the thing because I think the work, what we identify as revolutionary work, a lot of times is that like tough, macho male, sometimes very toxic part. But the important part that I'll say I've learned from a lot of black women in general and women in general is a lot more of that work is the slow, caring, um, bringing people home, dedication to people. And I'm not saying that that work is particularly gendered, but I think in our society, some people have a tendency to, to look at that more um, as opposed to the sort of like, you know, on the barricades kind of, kind of work. But um, I think it's incredibly important that we look at all spectrum of it, but understand that a lot of it is really slow work. It's like whittling away at these horrible, violent, destructive systems for, for black people, for brown people, for poor people. And the other thing is, we are going to win. The, I, mean, I can tell you this is a fact. The criminal legal system that exists in the United States of America today, at some point, will not exist. That's just a fact. It's literally, you go to a physics department and ask them, at some point, those prisons aren't going to be there. Might be a very long time from now. But all we can do is make that day come quicker. And if we do the work, it will come quicker. And the more we do it, the, the quicker it will come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing I like about becoming abolitionist is just the title is becoming rather than being. And I, I remember conversations we had a long time ago about the first title was Invitation to Abolitionism. And what I like about that is, is the gentleness and the humility, because I think that we need to think about abolition as a process of transforming ourselves in order to get ourselves ready, as well as transforming our society, what Grace Lee Boggs called dialectical humanism. And I think that kind of that notion then dissolves the, north, you know, the sort of um, incremental versus revolutionary, because we're making incremental change in ourselves as we try to pursue revolutionary change. And that seems to me to be also, you know, accountability is at the center of that, right? It's about holding ourselves accountable to the, this revolutionary notion, but holding ourselves accountable, um, holding others accountable, but also holding ourselves accountable to bring others along in a, in a loving way. And in the events that I've, you know, done with Derek before, I think you probably hear, I mean, I'm going to set you up. I'm going to set you up so bad. <laughs> I think you'll probably hear her express a lot of um, not, not confusion, but wonder at different possibilities, right? At, well, is violence justified in this, in this situation or not? I don't know, right? And for me, that is, that's the, the world and the conversation I want to be a part of is, is a, with, with brilliant, bold loving people who are wrestling with things rather than thinking that they have them all figured out. Hi, everyone. I'm not going last because I have anything particularly profound to say. I just wanted to listen <laughs> before I spoke and I wasn't ready because I was still um, thinking about what both of you all, um, both of you all share. But yeah, I, it's interesting. I also thought about Grace um, and Jimmy Boggs and Revolution and Evolution and um, um, Hegelian dialectic and how they use that to inform the organizing strategy when they were in Detroit, you know, trying to figure out what to do in the wake of the rebellion and King's assassination. So it's, yes, absolutely, the Boggs are here. The first time someone asked me about revolution was on a panel in the Netherlands. And when I answered, I thought about what I, well, I answered with an understanding of revolution that I thought was taking place back home in St. Louis, which means that there were a bunch of people who were angry in the streets and society was gonna change as a result of their presence, right? And then you read, you know, Grace and Jimmy, and they say, oh, well, that's not how revolution happens. Like, we has to be a part of changing the kinds of people we are in service of building the kind of world that we want. And we have to do these things at the same time over time. So absolutely. And then by the time I heard a similar question posed again, 
It was when I was in South Africa for the Feast Must Fall movement in Johannesburg. And I mean, I thought that the demands that I had as a student when I was in law school, when I was in undergrad, even as in high school, I was 14 years old, like doing student organizing. I thought our demands were great. I shared this with some of you before because we were smart and because we had good intentions. So that means that what we wanted were, were like the right, was the right thing to do. But I remember being um, at um, University of Wisconsin in Johannesburg, and there were students there who were in the occupation, partially because they were using it as a tactic to put pressure on the university to make education free, and partially because they couldn't afford to go home. Mm-hmm. So they were literally sleeping on the floor. I write about some of this in the book. They were, reading on, they were sleeping on the floors. They were passing around hats to collect money so they can get beer and bread. Usually the men would steal the money and go buy beer, and then women would fight them later and get money back so they could go buy bread. And they were doing this, literally eating slices of bread and reading Fanon and debating how Fanon impacted and informed their demands. And um, Vujani, one of the student organizers, at one of the meetings, he said, you know, the purpose of, our, of what we're doing here is not to move from Soweto, which, is, which was a historic township that was created by colonizers to create an easy um, access for black service workers to the white workers in um, in Johannesburg, he said, we're not trying to move from Soweto to Santon, which is like the rich whites. It's like, kind of like Brookline, but like <laughs> even more, you know. Um, I, that's not the goal, right, to go from Dorchester to Brookline. Like, that's not revolutionary, right? We need to understand how to be equipped, how to take care of each other, how to be in struggle, <laughs> so that we can make sure that we all have equal access to the land. Right. So the purpose of being transformed, of thinking differently about the world, struggling what it means to be a neighbor, a friend, a lover, a partner, a child, a sibling, that practicing that in community in these small scale spaces, you know, across these occupations and then across townships and across cities, that was in service of this broader struggle of figuring out, well, how do we get the land back and not make sure it's in the property hands of a few? And I was just like, wow, you know, we just want a, more black professors. Like, y'all are trying to, like, get the land back. We are, it's not the same. You know, the energy is not the same. They had big land taking back energy, and we did not have taken back energy at all. We were like, you know, we want critical race theory, which is important. But our, our desire and our demands for critical race theory was hopefully to prepare us to be better lawyers, to be better thinkers, to be better engaged in society but not necessarily towards broader revolutionary aims that upend our relationship to private property, our relationship to the carceral state, our relationships to how we do education, our relationship to healthcare, how we think about borders, uh, who's an immigrant, who's a citizen. Well, we have immigrants and citizens because we have borders and we don't have to have borders, right? And so those questions feel like, oh, wow, these are just some abstract theoretical, like, you know, what, if we could just use our imagination, it's like, well, People imagine terrible things mm-hmm. all the time. Slavery was somebody's imagination. Capitalism is imagination. Colonial, these are fixtures of imagination. And what, bring, I love what you said, Carl, about those things are much closer together. Because hopefully, and what we have to realize is that not only are we up against people who have the imagination, they have the resources, they have guns, they sometimes have the New York Times, they have the front pages of covers. They have the Boston Globe sometimes too. I'm not just gonna say that. So they have media, right? They have tanks, they have TikToks, they have so many, all this stuff on their side. So we have to be that much more imaginative if we're gonna be engaged in an evolutionary and a revolutionary process, right? We have to be that, we have to have that much more willpower to build the world that we want. And we have to use our best resources, which is people power. People power, right? People power. Like, that's why I keep, what do I keep telling y'all to do? Join a political home, right? Because that's how we build people power. Great. Well, thank you guys. So we framed it in terms of evolution versus revolution. And as several people have suggested, it's a blurry line, right? The line between evolution and revolution. Um, And Derica mentioned, of course, the goal of using your imagination to somehow see a better world, 
So let's talk about how you can convert your imagination into on the ground tactics. Carl mentioned you just go into court and you represent somebody in housing court. That's part of the revolution, right? The grind as you called it. What are some of the things that you guys are doing on the ground to promote abolition that might not feel grandiose, right? But are really important and are things that our students, our community, they could do in the world of practice as lawyers or as activists. Any thoughts? We don't have to go in a row. Whoever wants to grab the mic. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and also I wanted to add to what Derek has said, which I thought was dope, um, was they also told the people that we're fighting up against, they also got the time. Because <laughs> we... Not, not just the New York Times. Yeah, not the New York Times, but they actually got time. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's good. And so I just wanted to say that because, you know, we're on the ground every single day in the community. And, you know, when we're out here, yesterday one of our neighbors called and was like, we need diapers. And I'm like, dang, I'm about to go drop off T-shirts at the post office. And plus, I'm a mom, too. And I'm like, then the pipes at the office exploded. So I'm like faking like I'm a plumber. And, you know, and I'm like, I, how am I going to bring somebody diapers as well? You know what I mean? But it's important. And her baby needs diapers because I know when I, I didn't have diapers for my baby, I was like, whoa. So, you know, just the time, you know, of healing people, healing the community, creating an infrastructure that is actually being implemented. And it's not just imagination anymore or some imaginary world that's actually happening in the community. And so I'm really excited when I talk to, you know, college campuses, although I'm not a fan of talking to college campuses, only because I am a community member that lives in Roxbury and I will never... I'm not going to say I would never because my mom is Andrew and she's like, never say never. But, you know, the people in my community don't have access to go to Northeastern Law School. And we live right in Roxbury. And, like, they should have access to go to the school and have a free ride to go to the school. Because everything that they learn in this school, they're going to also implement it in the backyards that will end transgressions from happening in the community. So it should just be a basic accessibility for our community members. So I do hate the fact that we speak at schools. But I do understand the importance because the broader picture is healing the world, not just Roxbury. And so y'all are going to go off into your neighborhoods and take all this beautiful information and then spread it, right? <laughs> but, but anyway, and I love your shirt. Oh, thank you. Yes. So, but anyway, so the world that we, we have did a two and a half year listening tour across the country where we asked people what they needed, what they wanted, how can they stop causing harm to people, how, what made you happy? And one, number one in Massachusetts, one of those things that came out was that a lot of people didn't have access to affordable housing, and that's why they ended up incarcerated in the first place. And then 82% of those women were mothers. And so when you now say that people don't have access to housing, and then you talk about the, those people being mothers, and now children don't have access to housing, now you're talking about the most vulnerable population causing harm to provide and make a safe haven for their child. But going back to... Um, the fact that, you know, rent, I pay rent about $30,000 a month, maybe 28. 30, I mean, a year, sorry. So the salary is not added yeah. up, okay? <laughs> but but $30,000 a year about to, um, you know, to live, right? And then when we talk about incarceration, like it costs about $160,000, $162,000 per woman to keep a woman incarcerated. And so that we could probably like, what's that, four or five? I didn't, I wasn't the math professional, but that's about four or five women that we could provide housing for if we shifted away from incarcerating women for poverty and started to actually provide families with housing. And so when we looked at that, we were like, okay, well, how do we support women with housing? So we created basic basic housing, a basic housing pilot program where the, in the communities, like right now, we're in the most incarcerated corridor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which looks like a community of black and brown residents that are just over-policed, over-incarcerated, and under-resourced because we have one community center that really supports the people. And so we cre we're we creating that infrastructure. One, we have a, a basic income guarantee, which we also give incarcerated women basic income, which is $500 a month for a year. And if you're incarcerated, you get it until you come home, which we need the lawyers because we need y'all to help us fight to bring our women home because we don't have the funds that, you know, Massachusetts is just trying to spend $50 million on one new prison. 
we don't have a $50 million budget. So when we're making commitments to our incarcerated women and saying, hey, we're going to support you and our woman is, a, is serving a life sentence, we got to figure this out. So we need our lawyers to support us with participatory defense, mm -hmm. which is really important. It's also about empowering the community members and, so that way they have that confidence when we go into the court system. I remember I am, although I'm a community member and I'll always be a community member, whatever, but when I and I advocate to say, use your voice, stand on your platform, don't take no for an answer. But when I went to Quincy Court and I was facing the court system, I took I took no for an answer. I was like, you know what, I'm going to take this felony charge and I'm going to go home because it was either go spend six months in Flatter Framingham away from your newborn baby or take this felony charge that's going to follow you for the rest of your life for two years probation, but you'll still be a felon no matter what. So, of course, I took what was easier because I wasn't going to be separated from my child. But community members like me don't have to do that. And now that I know the impacts of that, it's important for us to uplift infrastructures like participatory defense. It's also important for us to uplift infrastructure infrastructures like transformative justice, which we're implementing in community learning how to not cause harm so you don't even end up in the system or whatever. What do you need? Also, the Liberation Project, we also are creating trainings for our community members to figure out like, yeah, we're stopping a new women's prison, but what do what, what are you doing so that way you don't cause harm? Like, what do you need so that way we can address that? And all of that is about healing the people, getting on the ground with the people. We just, we launched our basic income guarantee. You were laughing about our camper. We do have a camper. And the reason why we have... <laughs> but the, re the reason why we purchased the camper is because as an organization that is a formerly incarcerated organization, a black woman-led organization, we have problems in our own neighborhood getting land. And we're trying to create community centers. We're trying to create micro housing. We're trying to create spaces that community members can like heal and talk and woo-saw and meditate or just have a space to go to. And we can't even have access to those parcels. They're giving them to developers that are gonna build multi-million dollar condos and then push our people out. And we're trying to figure out how we can save our people so they, where they don't get pushed out. And it's real. And so we purchased a camper because we are abolitionists and radical and crazy. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how we drive having an 11 foot camper through Roxbury, but we've been doing it. And, but, you know, um, but it was, uh, it's, it's a meeting space. So pe community members can go organize. Uh, we have a community pantry where the camper will have clothes in it. And if you need, whatever you need, you can meet at the community pantry, but we'll go to Roxbury. So that way you don't have to come to the Warren Street around the corner. We're just in the backyard of everything around here. <laughs> but you don't have to go to Warren Street to get things. It's just an accessibility for all people um, but all these things are really happening in the neighborhood and we need people like y'all to also up uplift the movement to end incarceration of women and girls because we heard and I'm so happy that you said that that police prisons and jails are not going to exist in the future and it's important that we implement the movement now because the work that we're doing this conversation is going to impact seven generations forward and seven generations behind us so it, these conversations are very important uh, but just know that the work is happening in Roxbury and it's going to continue happening and even in Atlanta even in Louisiana our um uh, Danielle Metz is in Louisiana. She received uh, the last woman to receive clemency under the Obama administration, which we helped push out. She's in Louisiana advocating for clemency. I mean, this work is happening across the country, so it's not an imagination anymore. The only thing that is an imagination is your shirt with the um, the trees growing all over the police car because it's gonna happen. <laughs> yeah. First of all, thank you. <laughs> As a side note, I think the three of us are mothers. And I just, if you talk about personal transformation about your own deep seated beliefs of control and punishment, I don't, my wig is completely blown off. I just, I was, I'm like, every, no jails, no prisons, burn them all. I had kids and I'm like, you don't sit the fuck. I've never, I've never known a rage so deep. Or I'm just being honest. So truly, it's, of course, starting from the south. Wait, I'm See, we're not we're not allowed to say stuff like that, but that's real. So anyway, um, I, um, I, I, I didn't miss. Did Andrea talk to y'all about Miss Angie's story? 
um, I wanted to make sure that in top, that we specifically with the audience of lawyers, we talk about participatory defense as part of the infrastructure for reimagining communities, even while we know the courts aren't going to save save us that th that we're sort of in in the way of like realigning how we think. So also like in the context of lawyering in Massachusetts, just this week, there was the Mattis arguments at the SJC where you have Kaylin Campbell, a white lady prosecutor, really trying to say that we should let teenagers die in prison because she doesn't want to draw the line at 20 versus 18 about when your brain stops developing. And it's a shameful argument to give anybody a slow death penalty, but this is the scope of the conversation that they're having at the highest court in Massachusetts. And so part of the reimagination is, what are we going to do with each other? Like, is that what we're going to settle for? Like, if you just zoom out and you throw away your degree and you put it in plain English, we're talking about letting teenager, people convicted as teenagers, die in prison decades later. Like, what are we talking about? Then you have a prosecutor on the other side of the state in um, Berkshire <laughs> talking about, I filed a motion because I don't want to talk about, I don't think the defense should get to talk about race because it's inflammatory. <laughs> so everybody needs to f file a BBA complaint on that prosecutor for wasting the people's time and being outright ridiculous. But in any case, like that's the context of lawyering in Massachusetts. Yikes. So part of it is talking with people about like what else is possible and also the story. So like when we passed primary caretakers in 2018, policy written by formerly incarcerated moms, and, and fought for and won by the daughters of incarcerated parents. All it does is give you the option to file a motion once you've been convicted and ask the court for an alternative sentence so that you can stay home and parent your kid. And we went to churches and UU churches and synagogues and we went around the state and we asked white women from affluent communities, do you feel safer because somewhere across the state of Massachusetts, a mother is separated from her child? How does that impact your well-being? How do you see yourself as a part of a collective society where you're contributing to suffering because that's what's done in your name? And like Sashi said, building this shared responsibility for each other centered on the needs and the vision of the people that have been most directly impacted by the system. So that's also holding people to account for what it means to, as we say, like shift the ground and change the conversation. So that's a piece. And then participatory defense is just like, Instead of just free our people on the outside and like Pearl's talking, holding signs outside the jail that say free so-and-so, like really transforming the dynamics of the court and showing up as a community and saying this person is complicated. They're also whole, they're needed, they're valuable, and they're loved, and we refuse to let you take them from us without a fight. And expecting that the lawyer is going to be on that side and not on the side of just take this plea deal because it's more convenient for me. I think this is the best deal. And sometimes it is coming from like, a place of reality, like you, that's the metrics that you're really trying to assess, but like how you see yourself as aligned with um, the fight for freedom in this individual's case, but how this person's freedom is also a doorway to more people's freedom. And so that's why I just wanted to lift up Miss Angie. So they're trying to build a $50 million women's prison and the former uh, superintendent of MCI Framingham is now a deputy director at DOC said, we're absolutely going to build this. It's going to happen. So you can help us decide what colors we're going to paint the wall. Um, and we said, no, three years later, it's not built yet. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so they want to build this prison on the backs of the 45 women um, who are serving first and second degree life, many of whom are in their 60s and 70s, by the way. If you want to know what women are incarcerated in Massachusetts, they are grandmothers. Um, so one, they, there's women that they're like, we have to build a prison because what are we going to do with the lifers? Well, what we're going to do is a case-by-case -case review of every single woman in Framingham to find any scrap of a constitutional issue, any doorway, a million clemency petitions, whatever it takes. And because of a family that came to us and said, I don't want to let my mom die in prison. There's nowhere else I can go because she's had every appeal she could have. What should we do? We sat for years at participatory defense meetings, trying everything we possibly could. And on law. We, and then because that wasn't working, we had to drive around the governor's house and then we had to picnic on the governor's lawn and that still didn't work. Then we sent every district attorney like a message like, don't let people die in prison because of COVID. Did we think they were going to listen? No. Do we do by any means necessary? Yes. And so because of that, we got counsel assigned to Miss Angie again, who just fell in love with her because she's incredible and sat down with the people and sat down with her family and said, 
We're going to take it to the mat. F a COVID release. If that doesn't work, how about this? How about this? How about this? And Miss Angie is home right now. So, uh, how dare you? <laughs> and that was a fight of, uh, first and foremost, her daughter and, and her entire family backed up by the community. But how dare you build a prison on the backs of women that we intend to free? So that's part of the re restructuring of the conversation, too. Oh, we should just wrap up. That's <laughs> no, no. no, no. No, that was, no, I'm, just saying, I was like, I'm kidding. She was kidding. Wait, wait. But I did want to say because we're talking to future well lawyers, uh, future lawyers, because y'all y'all better become lawyers. We, that's it. And um, but you know when we were in New York last week at the Bronx Defenders, one of the of people who were speaking did 28 years. And he said that when he was inside of the court, he was, he was there, but he was not present. And I really thought that was important and everybody else was just talking around him, but he had no idea what was going on. And as a lawyer, it's your job to make sure that your client understands what's going on. And it's important, like this is, y'all are not the ops. Y'all are on the same team with each other. Go ahead. Yes. Speak that. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> I'm going to get the, the microphone. I want you to finish your point. No, no yes. but that was really my point. You know, so understand that y'all have to work together as a team and it's not okay for you to just listen to what the judge say. If your client is looking at 40 years or life, the health rate of people surviving 40 years inside of a prison is slim to none. They're rapidly deteriorating. So that, pretend that 40 years is a life sentence and fight for your client. And it's important for you to fight for your client. And it's important for your client to feel comfortable and not just feel like he's just standing in the room. Because I felt like that even in 2018, when I was in court, I'm like looking at the judge, looking at the DA. They're talking about the... Um, the brother, sister, yes, brother, sister, you know, the link. I, and I, I looked at mom, I'm like, are they brothers and sisters? And, 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 you know, that's the language, but that's not okay. Make sure that your client feels secure with you representing them. And that's it. Thank you, Sachin. Derek, Walter? I just want a second. I, when I was in Roxbury Court, the brother, sister, was very, very strange gendered phenomenon taking place in Boston courts. And I, I think we can start by abolishing that. I think, I think what they want to do is show a sense of camaraderie and respect and we're sort of on the same team working towards shared causes for justice. But no, it's not. It's not. It's literally the people of the United States or the people of Massachusetts versus one person. So it's, yeah, it obscures the actual violence that happens. It, reminds, it feels like a classic case of like Robert Covert, right? Violence in the War. If you guys haven't read that yet, please read that. But it, it feels like that happened in real practice. I was just going to say um, a, couple, a couple things to, to, on what, what y'all said, because it was so powerful. I took some notes. And just the brother-sister thing, if people, don't, if people aren't aware, if you haven't been in Massachusetts courts, many times, mostly prosecutors will refer to defense counsel as, my esteemed brother said, blah, blah, blah. And I, I don't want to abolish it because I'm waiting for the time that says that in front of a jury. Because I, when a prosecutor says that in front of a jury, I'm going to say, you heard counsel for the state refer to me as their brother. If anyone in this room is my, I'm going to use you as an example. If anyone is in this room is my brother or sister, it is my client who is my sister. I, I want someone to say it for me in front of a jury. I will, just, I will just put it down their throat. Then they can abolish it. <laughs> um, but I wanted to say a thing about, about land from, from what, what you were saying, Sashi, and from what you were saying, Mallory. Y'all know what neighborhood you're in here? Of Boston. Boston's 13 neighborhoods. You know what neighborhood this one is? It is Roxbury. Right. See, it's Roxbury. Or it used to be Roxbury. Like, you would, if you lived here, or can't really live here, but if you lived in this neighborhood, you would refer to this, and the signs used to say, the parking signs, that's how you can tell what neighborhood you're in Boston, what the park, when it says don't park, it says Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapian. Um, this was Roxbury, but Northeastern came. And then Northeastern didn't, Northeastern just been open enrollment, and it had, and it didn't have dorms. It was a commuter school. And then they didn't, they were like, oh, but we're going to go a little bit higher than that. We're going to be a little bit more selective, and we're going to be a little bit more fancy. Good for y'all. There you go. But then it wasn't Roxbury anymore, right? So this is occupied land. And then it's also occupied land, right? Because this wasn't before it was Roxbury, it was something else, right? This is the land of, you know, the greater Wampanoag people. Then why, then why, then why are there so many signs that says this is the first public park and the first public beach? Well, 
Well, what was it before? <laughs> <laughs> those are things. Um, you all quote fancy. You all yeah. quote fancy yeah. authors. I'm, I'm going to quote uh, Edward Said um, on, on colonialism. It's like nations are just collections of myths, and Northeastern is a collection of myths. Roxbury is a, is a collection of myths. Good ones, bad ones, ones that we like, ones that we don't like. But one of the things that it is, I'm going to assign some homework. If you are here, if you are here, you have a responsibility to be anti-colonial to those two things. You have a responsibility to the community that this is and was, and to even the, res the community it is and was before. There are indigenous people in Massachusetts just down that street working every single day. Is there a flag in here? There's not, that's good. Working every single day to change the flag of, of the state of Massachusetts, which is an utterly racist flag. There are people working to change um, uh, so-called Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day in, in Boston and Massachusetts. So there are people doing work for indigenous rights, indigenous sovereignty, indigenous liberation against colonialism. But we say all of those things in class. You can, it is better than having, one of the things we can do to be more liberatory, and I say this on every panel that I'm on, is stop having panels, right? Stop, we stop talking about the thing and do the thing, right? So people can go down the street to the, the, the uh, Native American Indian Council of Boston, which is just there in Jamaica Plain, and work with the people there. People can go to, you know, the Indigenous Day of Action uh, in, in, in so-called, in Plymouth, right? Um, and, and be in solidarity with Indigenous people there. And then separately from that, you know, the sort of occupation of Roxbury, people can go work with EFJA. People can go do, um, help work on clemency petitions for the National Council, because how many clemency petitions y'all have to file? All of them, right? Everyone. How many, like the, how many women are in prison nationally? Give me well, nationally? Yeah, give me some. Well, <laughs> yeah. Sounds right. That sounds right. So we'll go with 250,000. So 250,000. So how many clemency positions you all want to file? All of them, right? Yeah. All of them. So there is work that people can do. You're in law school. You're all busy. When you get out of law school, I don't know if anyone told you you're going to be more busy. Um, everyone's like, we're really busy. We're law students. I'm like, wait till you get out. Um, but there's work um, to be done. So one of the things I think, and that's a responsibility. That is a responsibility for us who live on colonized land, that live in places, that community, that people don't have access to the resources that, that we, like as be professors or as, as authors or as, as uh, community activists who have you know, jobs that you get paid. We, we have a responsibility to do and support folks that, that don't have access to that. And one of the things I'll say, and this is just an actual direct practice for people, when you meet a client that you are going to represent that is from a community, the first thing I say, because it, it makes me, it keeps me real. I say, I'm not here to help you. I work for you. It is like I am your chauffeur. You tell me where to go, and I drive there. There are some things that I make the decision on. I might be like, we don't have any gas. When me and my boy Tony came here, we didn't have any gas. We need to stop for gas, because I don't know if we're going to make it, even though it's two miles. Um, but there are some things that I, as a lawyer, get to make the decisions on. But that's not a lot. Right? And every one of those things, I have to explain to my clients, say, I'm making a decision, here's why I'm making a decision. Let me, and then I say, I work for you, I'm not here to help you, I work for you. That's a different thing. And if you don't understand something, that's only my fault. There's no, if you say, I don't understand that, it's not like, well, you got stupid because you don't understand it. Legal concepts aren't that complicated, although we like to make them that way. Mm -hmm. If you cannot explain part of the Fourth Amendment to your client, the Fifth Amendment, Right, what a drug certificate is to your client, or what you know, uh, just cause eviction is. If you can't explain that to your client, then don't be a lawyer. Right? Don't definitely don't be a community lawyer. Go work at a firm. Right? Um, and but those are things that you must do. And if, if when you say that when you first meet your client, it will come back on you. They'll be like, no, 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 no. You told me you work for me. You said that. Right? And then and, and people will use it against you in a good way because it will keep you real. It will be like, I'm not doing you a favor. I'm not being your friend because I sent you the discovery in the case. I'm doing it because I must, right? In two ways. One is a legal responsibility as a lawyer. And two, because we're out here trying to destroy the system and we know it's bad. And in the ideas of participatory defense, in the ideas that we are trying to be liberatory to our communities and we have access to a lot more resources, we, we must do those things. And the last thing I'll say as a little piece of homework is... Everyone up here believes that we can change the violent, unjust system that exists in the United States and a lot of times because of the United States around the world. We believe that that can happen. If you don't believe that that can happen, it's like being in the engineering school and not believing you can build a bridge, but you're trying to build a bridge. So, to be frank, I, I try to be not respectability politics, but get the fuck out of here with that. <laughs>
Like, you're not here. If you're in engineering school and you don't believe you can build a bridge and you try to build a bridge over the, the Charles, you're going to build a trash ass. You know how the bridge is not going to work, right? You, if you're doing this work, not all the time, because sometimes we waver. Sometimes we waver in that belief. But you have to believe that we can do things to make people free if you are working to make people and society free. So the first step, and you can do it before you walk out of this room, is believe that we can do that. Because uh, many of our ancestors in many different ways believe that. And many of us physically exist. It's not like we wouldn't be free. Many of us wouldn't exist if people before us didn't believe that, right? So for some of us, we deeply owe it. For all of us societally, we, we, we owe that work. Um, so that's my anyway. Thank you. So um, the question, if you all remember, was about the <laughs> boring work. And I think we just had, you know, three inspiring answers. So I want to talk about the boring work. Criminal legal system in our society is the keystone of the racial capitalist order, right? And we need to... <laughs> the criminal legal system in our society is the keystone of the racial capitalist order. And that racial capitalist order today is based on the idea of extracting a last round of surplus from people who have been deemed surplus from the, from the standpoint of capital, right? People who, who cannot be exploited for work. So trying to extract a last round of surplus from them. That happens in quotidian, in boring legal ways, right? That happens through fines and fees. That happens at the level of municipal law. That happens in, in bond issues. Dustin Jenkins wrote a book called Bonds of Inequality, right? That happens through payday loans, and it happens through for-profit policing. So when Sashi's saying that she can't get a piece of land in her neighborhood, that's because of a set of incentives to developers. All of those things are up for contestation. They are all, as you said, I mean, law is simple, right? And if you explain to people, if you explain to them how, and, and I just mean regular people, I mean people like the people that I talk, talk to at home in Missouri, like conservative people. If you explain how tax increment financing works to them, they can tell it's theft. They can tell it is just giving money to companies, right? Now that's arcane and it's boring, but that also I think is part of the project of, of abolition. It's boring, you see? <laughs> um, I thank you for um, re repeating that. This isn't directly answered to the question, it's just, I, it, that, that it's so, so important because I think it speaks to um, what I think you said about 100 and $60,000, it could be housing, theoretically, for five people, but it's not. It's income for two prison workers, right? right? Because if you have two prison workers who get to be carceral babysitters, you get to have an economy of people who get to be employed for, to manage people who are in prison. And it's the same with police. So changing the colors of police doesn't stop the extraction. It just means you're being attracted by gay or blacker cops, right? But the order is still in place. And so when Lori Lightfoot, the mayor of Chicago, when the defund movement gained popularity in 2020, she goes, oh, you know, I, I can't do a good Lori Lightfoot impersonation. You would have to pay me to do this. But here's a black queer mayor in Chicago. And what does she say? She said, you want, look, almost verbatim, you want me to defund or eliminate the, one of the only ways that black and brown people can enter the middle class in Chicago, that's why she wants to keep police. They just tell it, they just tell it on themselves. I don't have to even say this is like a boogeyman situation. She wants to protect policing as a jobs program. With Joe Biden, I didn't watch the State of the Union last night because I had to prepare for LeBron James to pass up cream. <laughs> <laughs> but I know last year, I know what he said. He said, fund the police, fund the police, fund the police, right? Like, he is interested in getting 100,000 more cops on the street, not necessarily because of public safety. Like, these are jobs programs. So when people panic when prisons close in rural communities, it seems like at least we're there. 
it seems like enough liberals have at least acknowledged that it's probably not a good thing that like communities are tying their entire economy to the number of beds that have to be filled in order for a prison to make money so that it can be a labor source for a community. So we're there, we're almost there. I think the public has shifted in the last 10 years to at least understand that. But police just somehow are just different, right? It's just like, oh, no, no, no. Like, I go to coffee with a cop. I go to books and badges programs. If you have seen the Shade Room feature the Black History Month squad cars, have y'all seen this yet? You should not be following the Shade Room. But if you do follow the Shade Room on Instagram, you're going to see, like, so this is the response to protect the order, right? To protect the order. And so... We, we can't forget that when we say that police primarily manage inequality, what we're saying is that the, the 10 million arrests that happen every year are happening to people who are poor. The people who are arrested more than once, like 80% of them, have incomes of $10,000 a year or less. $10,000 a year or less, right? So when Walter is saying that these are the people who cannot no longer be exploited through their jobs, through their workplace, and now they become a source of income to manage. We learned this also from the people who are in the disability justice activist space, because what do they say? They say, well, because capitalists and liberals are not committed to changing the social order to ensure that everyone can do the kind of work that's fulfilling and the work that our society needs, we institutionalize people and we create economies of care. So then they become a source of exploitation. Right. So that like having that level of analysis then informs your theory of change as lawyers, as organizers, as community workers, because then why would you just want a better system of exploitation? Why would you want just a more diverse system of extraction? Why would you want to ref why would you spend time reforming that and defending that? Right. And so I think what happens and this goes back to the revolution question is that when social movements happen, and they disrupt society, and these questions get asked, we see people um, become like either wedded to what they've been working on for five years or 10 years or 40 years where they've been committed to doing these things and maintaining the status quo. So then we start asking questions that threaten their labor, their scholarship. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We have to dismiss it. Whoa, that's not realistic. That's not real. But we have to keep asking those questions. And the last thing I'll say is that I actually disagree a little bit with Carl about, don't apologize. We can disagree. No, so what I said. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Y'all know I love disagreeing with people because it, it makes us sharper. I disagree a little bit with, um, a little bit with Carl about, Carl about having to believe that, like, we're going to win. If I don't want, is, yes. And I talked about this in somebody's class earlier about Derrick Bell um, and how there are people who are pessimistic about the state of affairs and still struggle and still fight, and still do labor. All right, there are people who made sure that people can run away and escape slavery who wasn't sure if slavery was going to end or not, but they helped people escape. And so if you're willing to do the work and you don't necessarily have to be tied, you could be a radical pessimist who's going to do the labor and say, you know what, I'm not sure how this shit's going to work out, but I know this is wrong, and I'm going to like be willing to fight. And I think that that's a useful energy because right now, there are other kind of pessimists who's telling you it's not worth fighting, that the struggle is not worth it, that it's not worth trying to figure out that we're literally are born dead. You know, I mean, these are Afro pessimists, but there are other kind of pessimists who are who are, you know, discouraging struggle because of fatalism. And I believe that there's a radical tradition of pessimism. I think of people like Derek Bell, who's like, well, this is permanent, but raise hell anyway. And I want all people who are willing to raise hell, whether they believe we're going to win like Asada or Marx, or whether they're going to be like, I'm not sure, but I'm still going to fight. We need as many people to be a part of that as possible. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. So we have some time for questions. There must be questions. You ready to join forces with this group or what? <laughs> Come on, don't be shy. This is new soul. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Brianna, and I'm just curious if you guys could um, share your um, opinions on the child welfare system and how we need to talk about the abolition of that. <laughs> <laughs> I am, you might not even, I'm a foster kid. Um, my, 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 my father wasn't in my, my 
biological father, as they say. My biological father was into my life when I was a kid, and my um, my mother died when I was my biological mother died when I was very young, and I was adopted by my my uh, maternal grandparents. But I was a foster child, right? And I was inside of my family, but I saw some of the foster system, and I know foster system. I also I come from indigenous ancestry, which I don't usually say to people, but like I'm Narragans of Narragansett ancestry in Rhode Island, which is what now so-called Rhode Island. Um, and people, do people know about ICWA in the, in, in the indigenous uh, cases that are before the Supreme Court? I mean, what's happening there is just classic. Like every, if you just look at that case, listen to some of the podcasts, read the arguments before the Supreme Court, like just stealing kids in a different way. They've been stealing indigenous kids for since, since colonizers came here, stealing them, selling them literally like hundreds of years before the, the, the United States existed. And it is, if you look at that, if you look at what is happening in Canada, in the United States, um, with indigenous children, in Australia, anywhere where there are indigenous people, right, this is happening. It's just a model, right? Um, that structure, um, also this happened under, under Pinochet and the dictatorship in Argentina and in Chile. Um, people, they just took left-wing kids and they'd be like, oh, you have an infant. We're going to give it to this right-wing family and raise it. There are people who exist now who don't know who their parents were, right? But this is a classic way of, it's a divide and conquer with children, right? And the idea that you're poor, you shouldn't be able to raise a child. Like that's a rule that basically exists in the United States. I had a client here, just in Roxbury, across from the mall. They came in the house, child, welfare, child services came in the house and they said, one of the reported issues was the children have beds that don't have headboards. <laughs> I was like, I'm like, wait, you're supposed to have headboard? I grew up with a head. Did you have that? Did you grow up with a I was, <laughs> and I was all like, wait, I, is that a thing? I literally like, was kind of like re-examining my life. Like, is that the <laughs> thing that's really, is there something, that, is there a disease that you get if you don't have headboards? But some, <laughs> someone who is an educated person, I'm gonna read it, probably went to Northeastern, right? <laughs> so they wrote down, this kid doesn't have, the children don't have headboards. And I was like, what the, does that even mean? But it's the same thing with gang, with gang affiliation. They're like, oh, he has a tattoo. They have a predilection with guns. They all associate with the same color. I'm like, we have, that's the police department too. Right? <laughs> like you can go to some rich people's house and they have some fancy ass bed that's shaped like something that doesn't have a headboard. They're not taking those kids away. But if you have two other things, and maybe they don't have a, like a lot of fresh food in the refrigerator because they shop at the, like the bodega on the corner and the bodega just got sugary drinks and they're like, not healthy beverages, no headboard. I don't know how many points you need, but if you get four, we're, we're probably gonna like refer the case and you gotta come to a hearing and we might take your kids away, right? Probably not just for those things, but you're closer. And that, I mean, what, if a kid grows up in a foster home, like it's a crapshoot, man. Lucky, but I think my grandparents were there. So he knows my grandmother and grandfather. I, I was raised by some of the best people in the world and I probably have my politics because my grandfather was a socialist and got the newspapers. Um, so that was a good thing for me, but most people that isn't the case. And, and it is part of the larger carceral system that exists in the United States. We should always be talking about it. Folks at Law for Black Lives have been working on that and, um, and we should continue. Yeah. Oh. Um, I'd like to say also that you know, the current system, we, so I was at an event um, over the summer and there was this woman who had a baby and I was like, oh, you know, your baby is so beautiful. And of course, like as a mother who has, I call her a baby hyena because she's always screaming, <laughs> so, like, you know, but I'm trying to make relation to the, this new mom. And she's like, oh, I'm not, this is not my baby. You know, I, I foster the child. And I was just, and she was just saying like how the baby's mom struggles, like goes into relapses of like substance use. And sometimes she snaps out of it or whatever that looks like. Um, but then she'll go back and the baby goes back and forth for her through the foster care system. And so, you know, I just think about how she's like, I'm like, dang, that must be hard. And I guess I was just being nosy because I was like, dang, that must be hard to like, you know, provide child care or like, you know, like how do you work? And then put because I'm like, my daughter's with me all day long because child care is $1,700 a child. So I'm like, dang, how you just be paying for somebody else's child to go to school, you know, or daycare and then provide food and then diapers and like all this stuff and she was like oh well the state pays for that for me and i'm like hmm substance use mental health poverty 
new mom, I'm a mom, I'm right there at the borderline of all of those things that I just mentioned because of being a mom. But because you're willing to be a foster mom, you get all of these things for free. And why are we providing the actual mom with these tools so that way she can be a healthy, thriving mom? Because, like, I don't know all of the percentages of all of that. That's why it's important for researchers and all the talking points that they provide to organizers and all that. But, you know, I know the percentage of, like, foster care children, like, entering incarceration, poverty, or dying by the age of 21 is, like, at an all-time high. I read it, and I was like, whoa, it was, like, over, like, 60%. And I'm like, you don't see the problem with that? Like, why wouldn't we give the tools to the parents so that way they can operate and keep their children and then be healthy, thriving people so they can raise healthy, thriving children and then create healthy, thriving communities? And so that's how I feel about the child welfare system right now. I feel like... It sucks. <laughs> and I think that we should be trying to give all the resources to the parents so that way the parents can raise their children the right way. And I, don't, I didn't have a headboard. And even grew, growing up, like, I, I mean, my room was like a closet. I'm like, geez, you know? And um, I barely had a room. I was like, and we slept on the couch most of the time. That was the thing. So to think about that, I can only imagine. But yeah. Yes, I shared a story in someone's class yesterday, also a foster care care, and I said that my siblings and I were mostly taken from our mom because we were poor. And there was utility insecurity, food security, she got sick, and there was lots of absenteeism. And a social worker and a cop showed up at our house and took us to strangers, and those strangers were violent. And so, yes, I, even before I had an analysis, was like, no, 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 to like foster care. No, what are you fostering? You know, no. Um, there's that. And then... Have you all read The Dispossessed? Uh-oh, I see some smiles. Okay, yes. If you have not read The Dispossessed, please read The Dispossessed. It's like a 1970s anarchist classic. Um, and there are very simple scenes in the... I know you have time for reading, endless reading. Um, <laughs> but this one is, is this one's absolutely worth it. Now, I won't give all the book away, but essentially there's this anarchist on the moon and we see this anarchist society on the moon through the lens of, this, of the main character. And one thing that's very, very simple that, um, that the society have is just, like, 24-hour, like, dorms, okay? And this is for children of, like, all ages. And what the dorms essentially do is help children, like, live, like, communally and learn how to be in a shared society and learn how to, you know, um, share resources. And so you don't have, uh, you know, millions of single-family homes. You don't have to privatize dependents. You don't have to have individualized, privatized care that's responsible on the, on the person. And so I remember being in law school and taking a class with Kiera Bridges, and we were learning all of these, like, queer critiques of marriage. And one of the critiques was that it privatizes dependence, that it incentivizes people to get married because it absolves the state of responsibility for taking care of people. And so what's interesting, even with, like, what foster care does is say that, oh, we just sort of help people share in the child rearing, but it's through still a system of exploitation. We actually could have an entirely different system that gives lots of people the ability and the freedom to live the kind of worlds that they want, to build healthy relationships, to be healthy adults, to not have to, like, just, like, quote, get individual resources right, to then figure out how to be responsive, but having to create an entire city or a, a society where, like, well, what if we all share, you know, different sorts of labor? You know, what if we had different relationships to how children are raised in the first place? And people are like, oh, that's socialism. But, yeah, when you look at boarding schools, <laughs> some of y'all went there. Some of y'all have been going to boarding school since you were in third grade. Some of y'all have been in dorms your whole lives. You're in dorms right now, you know? Oh, it's okay, it's okay. So it's interesting when, it's, I, I don't like what AOC says, it's like socialism for the rich and like capitalism for the poor because that's not what socialism or capitalism is. But I think what people like her are trying to make bright is that the systems that actually could be like more shared, more routine, um, more a part of our social society, we see them set up in areas of privilege, right? We see them set up, we see those similar systems. Well, wow, like why are people, why do you have to be a millionaire to like for your kid to live in the dorm? <laughs> you know, it's kind of ridiculous. Like, why is that the case? We actually could just have lots of communities with lots of dorms so that parents don't have to worry about childcare if they want to go to school. 
or if they want to, you know, have a nightlife or a social life or go or go, you know, go to theater. Right. And kids can learn how to be in relationships. So they are aspiring to then have more private property, more private things to then pollute the earth. Right. So all of these things are so connected and require us to have a different kinds of imagination, which is why I love that book and her writing so, so much, because she gives us windows into that. Robert E.G. Kelly at the end of Freedom Dreams, he gives us a window into that. I don't do a great job. I try in my book at the end to be like, oh, yeah, we can just have totally different things that are already in the making that can help us re reorient ourselves to privatization, to love, right, to health to our planet. And that's why I think the work of abolition requires us to I just want to say one thing really late, really quick. So when, my, when, I was, when I was six months, my dad went to prison for 12 years. And then when my little brother was six months, my mom went to prison for 20 months. And I learned that when my mom came home that, because this was a huge thing, the child welfare, because this is a whole movement across the country of women, incarcerated women specifically leading the fight. Because if you go to federal prison in some, some areas, after 18 months, your child is automatically put up for adoption and you lose access to your child. And imagine my mom being sentenced to 20 months for her. For, my mom has, I always be like, yo, this is crazy because she got mad because we threw a dead mouse out the window, okay? So imagine her just being, she, to me, she's the most beautifulest person. And I'm not only saying that because she's my mom, but she's, that's just facts. Like, she's just like a loving person. And I'm like, could you not be that loving? And, <laughs> and so to see her go to federal prison for 20 months when my little brother was six months old, and thank God we had a strong dad who was amazing and who drove to Danbury two and three times a week to go visit her with a newborn baby to make sure that my little brother never went into the foster care system or even be put up for adoption. But that's not the case for a lot of women that are incarcerated and they lose access to their child and beyond and it only causes more harm and a lot of women are still right now trying to find their children and also the ones that have found their children they're trying to figure out how to repair their relationship with their children and so I just wanted to also uplift that because women are suffering incarcerated women are suffering incarcerated women's children are suffering so su suffering so it's not only I don't want us to think of the w child welfare system as a visual of like women who are currently in the community being stripped away from their children but also understand the full circle of like what you were saying like you know how yes this system could be put in place to up help and provide like support or whatever for the community but like it's also tying back directly to incarceration which is a bigger system of like causing harm because taking women away from their children like my mom was sentenced to, to do incar incarceration for a financial crime and if she was a white woman she would have never went to prison she would have just simply got probation or parole or a fine or a fee but no she got sent to prison for 20 months Okay, and she was a Northeastern alumna. I learned, which I learned the other day, when she graduated in 1998. I was like, oh my God, don't say that again. <laughs> I, w I really thought it was like 2020. That's what it felt like, but it wasn't. Um, but I was just scared. I was like, damn. So, but you know, thinking of that, I just wanted us to understand that. And then I'm gonna just, I'm gonna stop, I promise. But I wanted to also, for us to think about when we go off into being lawyers that y'all are going to be or y'all already are, whatever, like we, one of our clemency fights right now when we're advocating for clemency is that lawyers won't help us with a lot of cases because some of the cases are people who have caused harm to children. Mm -hmm. And so, so they literally reject these cases. And I just want to scale back in all the things that we talked about, poverty, mental health, substance use, lack of access to childcare, all these things are real life issues that a lot of people don't deal with every day. And it literally can sing you over the edge. Does it mean that you should not be held accountable for causing harm or does it make it okay? It does not make it okay. But real life people, do things that are not okay, but it's, they still need support. And especially incarcerating a woman for 30 years because they may have caused harm to their child. I mean, living inside of a prison for 30 years, thinking about the fact that you caused harm for, to your child is already excruciating pain. I, You know, Mallory, we were new mothers, and I yelled at my daughter a couple of days ago, and I was like, don't you ever 
do that again. And she was like, I'm sorry, mommy. And I was like, I should have never yelled at you like that. So imagine if it went further and then I was inside of a prison and none of that pain was addressed. Nothing, a prison doesn't address any of that. And so I just want us to know that when we start to advocate for clients and you do, you will have a case because I had to sit here and deal with it because when I first started doing the clemency applications four years ago, I was a new mom. And a lot of the cases that I was reading were about women causing harm to their children. And I was like, I can't support this. This is horrible. But I started to listen to their stories. And I started to listen to where they come from. I started to listen to that lack of access that they had, that they've been screaming for help way before this even happened. And they never got help. And so I want y'all to always have that in your heart or as you move forward, because you still have to have a heart. That's something that nobody can take from you. And you have to have a heart and you have to have that compassion for your clients and understand that people are going to do things that you may not agree with, but there's a whole trail that led them up to that point that could have been prevented, it could have been redirected, whatever, if they had the right support. So that's it. We have time for one very quick question. We only have a couple minutes. Yes. Okay, I don't know how quick it is, but first off, thank you. Um, I'm a two owl, and I've been so hungry for a conversation like this in law school. So it's just been like such a joy. So thank you for being here. Um, I was reminded on Monday at Erica's talk there was a, a one owl who mentioned how the criminal law curriculum, at least her class, um, is disempowering. There's no discussion of racial capitalism. Certainly, you know, very limited to any discussion of abolition. Um, we are so lucky to have a criminal law professor on the panel, Professor Medwed. Um, so uh, to, to put you on the spot a little bit, um, I'm, I'm wondering how you are thinking about incorporating abolition into your class and your curriculum and all of the classes that you teach. And, and maybe for everyone else, um, you know, I know political education is, is, of course, a personal responsibility. There's a lot we can do as individuals. But I'm wondering kind of your thoughts on kind of structurally what law schools can do to shift curriculum pedagogy so that we are training not just smart and kind lawyers, but lawyers who have a political analysis and a political commitment. Thank you so much. Just a quick word on this. We believe very much in expertise, and you invite experts to participate in panels like this. Yeah. And you invite people like Eric Purnell and Carl Williams and Sachi and Mallory and Walter to share their wisdom with you. And Andrea James. And Andrea James, exactly. And maybe, ideally, recruit them to become members of our faculty. <laughs> so thank you all for your time. Thank you for your question. We are out of time, unfortunately, because there's a class that's coming in here. Can um, we just make an announcement? Announcement, please, yes. Um, so, so, and I'll give it to you for the think tank. But, um, there's a big action tomorrow. The state in which you are living and studying is trying to build a $50 million women's prison. By the way, they're also trying to build a $21.5 million jail for children. And now there's discussion about building a, a 95, 120 bed jail in Bristol County with a brand new progressive sheriff. So if you want to join us and take action, Please, 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 it's all hands on deck at the State House uh, downtown tomorrow at 3 o'clock. We're mobilizing people to show up and show out and support the jail and prison construction moratorium and also put pressure on the Healy administration, who has decided to change none of the leadership at the Department of Correction that's imposing so much suffering on our people. She also needs to be held to account for her power to release people from prison on clemency. So if you can be with us tomorrow, 3 o'clock at the State House. Uh, and you can meet people in our movement and you can get deeper into the work, but just your presence will be a massive way to, to change the conversation in Massachusetts. Three o'clock. Yeah, at the, at, right out in front of the State House at 24 Beacon, Beacon and Park. Yep. And then also, as when we were talking about creating what different looks like, this is not about the meeting. Which you could get flyers right at the door because um, I was prepared. But listen, so we're creating, so we inherited a land in Martha's Vineyard in Oaks Bluff, and we're working to create a, re a retreat think tank center for women and girls to do research, to do training, to do work on reimagining communities, to come together, to cook, to woosah. I always say that the police have a police academy where if they witness a transgression, they can go there, get meals cooked for them, Saw milk cows and community members actually need this as well and we're actually working to create that and we call it the free her retreats think tank center and i'm probably getting all of those words wrong and andrew is probably going to get you mad but anyway you get the point and that's the blueprint right there that is uh and we are raising 1.5 million dollars to build this retreat center 
and um, we're doing that by selling T-shirts. So we're not. We do ask for individual donor donations, but we we don't want that. We want people to buy T-shirts because these are t- these are conversation starters. And when you're in the the you know getting your nails done, or if you're shopping, food shopping, whatever, I want to get my nails done. But if you whatever you're doing, you know people are gonna look at your shirt and say, "What does free her mean?" And you can just have a conversation. It means that we're ending incarceration of women and girls, dismantling all prisons and jails, and so supporting the people and here's where you can get a t-shirt and so there are papers over there that's the blueprint that we had an architect help us design um and that's where all the funds for the t-shirt is currently going so we really need this this is groundbreaking especially for formerly incarcerated women because we do not have a safe space for us and this is going to be a safe space that's it